get us take a seat. We're going to get started here now. I just want to quickly uh, say thank you to Steve and Lisa for putting together what has been an incredible weekend. I think we can all agree that we've had some uh, amazing speakers, great panels. It's been really powerful, moving, and um, educational. I learned a lot uh, this weekend, and I, I hope you did as well. Thank you. Uh, so I don't want to keep you too late, so I'll just quickly uh, present our panelists. First, um, we're going to start with Greg Hewlett. He is a writer and ESL instructor living in Toronto. Uh, upon moving there in 2017, he found that distance from Newfoundland and Labrador came the heightened urge to dig deeper into the project that so threatened the home he just left. And he uh, wrote a six-part series about Muskrat Falls that you can find on the Overcast website. And then we'll have Des Sullivan, who is a businessman based in St. John's. Since 2012, Sullivan has posted the Uncle Gnarly blog. Uh, the website is strictly Newfoundland and Labrador publication, which promises opinions on Newfoundland politics that bite. And next we have Robin Whitaker, who teaches anthropology here at Memorial. Her research focuses on Northern Ireland and Newfoundland and Labrador, where she has explored questions of gender, political culture, democracy and citizenship, abortion access and household debt. And finally, we have Justin Brake, who is a reporter for the Aboriginal People's Television Network in Ottawa. As reporter and editor for the Independent of .ca, Brake covered the Indigenous-led Muskrat Falls protests extensively, work which earned him both civil and criminal charges, and a 2016 Human Rights Award nomination. <laughs> All right, so first off is Greg Hewlett. Apologies in advance for sticking to the script. Uh, much more a writer than a speaker. I'd like to begin today with six descriptions of the Muskrat Falls project. A project touted for its contribution to a sustainable energy future and pursued doggedly for its renewable energy credentials by provincial and federal governments failing to meet emission targets not only produces huge amounts of CO2 and methane, but also becomes the foremost source of a debt that effectively binds provincial economic survival, at least in the near term, to oil and gas production. A project presented as the cornerstone of the province's long-term economic and energy security becomes a palpable threat to both. A project whose massive capacity is justified solely on the merits of future export revenues becomes one with no discernible viable markets. A project proposed as a major public asset becomes the medium through which an essential service and its customers are financialized into a source of revenue on the global bond market and an upward transfer of wealth that is subtle as it is significant. A project in the era of so-called reconciliation criminalizes efforts to protect indigenous cultures and ancestry and ancestry under siege. In response to, in <coughs> excuse me, in response to Dr. Bernander's North Spur reports, Nelcor commissions a review of the original SNC-Lavalin research that deliberately neglects to engage with Bernander's fundamental criticism, that the data and, and methods employed in this original research are wholly inadequate for, for addressing the issues identified by his analysis in the first place. None of this is news to anyone, I know. What's been publicly stated about the Lower Churchill Project by government and Nelcor has turned out in a baffling number of cases diametrically opposed to what in reality unfolds. In taking together these six descriptions, the idea was to establish the kind of irrational, irrational pattern that seems to plague the project at every step. But I realized that calling it irrational fails to capture what in retrospect turns out to look downright predictive. That is, each major claim giving rise in time to its antithesis. Now, I won't be swinging back the other way to suggest that far from being irrational, these outcomes are the result of some grand conspiracy. Nobody could possibly set out for such dismal goals. I give these examples instead to suggest the chasm between rhetoric and reality that has been a defining mark of the Muskrat Falls project. I'd like to take a moment to zoom out to an ancient theme that I keep coming back to in my more re reflective moments of thinking, reading, and writing about Muskrat Falls, and one that I think uh, builds well on, on so much of what's been said already today. And that theme is man versus nature. Forgive the gendered usage of man here. I use it not to neglect other genders, but to implicate my own. 
as it's largely men resp responsible for deeply ingraining and perpetuating a paradigm of thought and a way of being in the world that, that by the 21st century is most emphatically caught up with us. Our drive to conquer nature turns out to serve us about as well as it would a newborn baby out to conquer its mother. If the bright side of industrial capitalism Industrial capitalism has been to spread material wealth over the world, albeit very selectively. Its dark side has been to unleash the power of our knowledge and rational minds in such a way that, as we now know, is taking us headlong in worldwide climate breakdown. The thing about our rational minds is that they're nearly always in the service of what we already want or don't want to believe, loath to admit it though we are. Self-interest, for example, is eminently rational. Corporations routinely rationalize virtually anything in the name of profit. But rational self-interest writ large as a species guiding ethos eventually results in the breaking of humanity's life-enabling pact with nature. You take care of me, I'll take care of you. It seems to me the megadam is a classic symbol of man against nature. The radical alteration of a landscape it requires can of course be rationalized functionally. For the ecosystem in question, however, and for those who live in and through that ecosystem, that radical alteration could only be experienced as deformation and defilement. In the Megadam is reflected a worldview that like the unfettered capitalism we know today refuses to place value in what it so glibly writes off as externalities, but what can more accurately be called social and environmental well-being or even more to the point, the health of human beings and the earth. And so what we have is a remarkable feat of engineering that will produce re renewable energy for decades to come. Okay, and the externalities? Quoting limnologist David Schindler, citing 40 years of research. Canadian dams have strangled river systems, flooded forests, blocked fish movement, increased methylmercury pollution, unsettled entire communities, and repeatedly violated treaty rights. Of course, all these would stand even if the economics made sense. And thank you to Denise for giving us such a vivid uh, picture of that for this project. But how seriously were they taken any of these well-documented impacts in the lead up to Muskrat Falls? Before the Labrador land protectors and others in the region began to stand up for the future of their water and food, and by extension, their culture and ancestry, to what degree were these factors weighed and considered? How about since then? The answer speaks volumes to our priorities, and those priorities in turn are informed by society's values. It has been, I think, very sad to witness the response, not only of government, but the province as a whole, to the multiple years of indigenous-led resistance to this project. Our variety of underwhelming responses, from long silences to the efforts to placate the civil and criminal charges, have all had something in common. My theory is a kind of implicit, possibly subconscious, widespread resistance to the idea that our government could really be engaged in an enterprise that does measurable harm to the basic resources of life. It's a theory that could help explain why many were so reluctant to call the Labrador land protectors by their own self-designation insisting on protester over protector. To call them protectors is acknowledging something needs protecting, at which point how on earth do you justify land criminal charges? You can rationalize it, but you can't justify it. There's a reason injunctions can be filed to keep people off a work site, but not to keep mercury from accumulating in a food chain. And now being months since the final report was submitted, government seems to have decided simply not to respond to the recommendations of the IEAC recommendations that vindicated land, the land protector's concerns from a committee whose very formation was framed as an olive branch that is evidently left to wither. I don't think it far-fetched to suggest that a project of this kind and those undertaking it should be judged in part by what it considers acceptable collateral damage. The official line seems to be that mercury levels probably won't, probably won't reach dangerous levels for all that long, and if they do, they'll be monitored but that we insist on taking the risk is again indicative of our priorities and the values that underpin them. So too with the standing of that very word, risk, the fetish of finance, so gravely applied to money matters while holding so little sway in those of human health. This is borne out again so acutely in the case of the North Spur. Now CORE's geotechnical peer review panel, by its own admission, as we already saw, has not performed any calculation to verify the accuracy, completeness, or validity of the results obtained by SLI. Therefore, as a response to Dr. Bernander's findings, it falls far short of the burden of proof and what a burden it is. There's no doubt the geotechnical analysis in question 
It's far above the head of any non-engineer and maybe we're made to feel helpless by the enormity of what's being implied. Another part of us probably just refuses to believe that, that the supposedly responsible adults in charge could let this happen. But the history we already know of the Lower Churchill Project begs we keep this part of ourselves in check. In 2010, not many of even the skeptics among us would have thought it could all turn out quite so badly as it has. Tangible, scientifically informed warnings are on the record, and their conclusions insist that we believe the worst case scenario is very possible. Only due diligence on the part of NALCOR can determine this. All we know for sure is that not one more time can we afford to take their word for it. As historian Jim Bannister took pains to point out at the symposium in Happy Valley Goose Bay, we do well to remember the specific climate of the times when this project was conceived and sanctioned. That is, in his words, the high water mark of Newfoundland nationalism, marked by a fever pitch that had the force behind it not only of a charismatic egomaniac chasing a leg legacy project, but also of potent historical wounds and resentments, most especially in this case, the collective humiliation of the infamous Upper Churchill deal. Maybe the seemingly tidy resolution of redeeming one mega dam with another played a part in luring us to Muskrat Falls, but so too did the show of might involved in damming the brute force of the Grand River. It was a perfect fit for the bravado of a people taking what's theirs. Imagine conquering nature in Quebec in one go. I'd say a certain charismatic egomaniac once got chills. Sorry, Danny. Don't mind. Let me save you the call to the lawyer there. Take it back. Because if there's one person who's uh, owed an apology in this mess, is Danny Williams, right? Eight years after giving full heed to the impulsiveness of that time, whose purest expression was the sanctioning process that ran roughshod over every democratic mechanism it encountered, we face, a f we face a future in which it's very possible that our pressing need for debt relief could result in the loss of at least part of the ownership of the Lower Churchill Project to private interests, federal government, or God forbid, Audrey Quebec. And we see to our disbelief the ghost of the same sick joke flowing downstream from the Upper Churchill to haunt the Lower, the possibility of losing the benefit of our own resources again. Today, when the big picture is so murky for so many and into that picture is injected the fear of doubling electricity costs, the vague dread that's been mounting for years of what this project will mean to people's daily lives suddenly takes hideous form, that is for people off on the island, as that has been very specific dread and concrete for a long time in, in Labrador ever the outsiders until we're in the mood for a mega dam, a mega project. But that form, so do, and so the people's responses take hideous form as well, namely fear and resentment with panic and anger and ever far behind. Indeed, the public consciousness of the project has been obscured from many sides. The flows of information pass through many partial filters. The challenge of interpreting and contextualizing complex processes unfolding over many years a challenge heightened by defunded and reduced investigative capacity and a journalism held captive by click-based values and heightened again by the reptilian free-for-all of Facebook and Twitter. If this all doesn't promote superficial understanding, we then have to contend with politicians doing their utmost to distort and confuse public perception still further by subjecting every development to partisan hackery, embittering for the public the void left in the wake of honest and accurate communication. A screamingly obvious self-interest at work in the political arena reflects a system that seems to thwart the few good intentions that do exist within its toxic frame. But I think that what people want and need right now, even if we wouldn't dare be so naive as to hope for it, is simply to be respected enough by our elected officials to be leveled with as adults about the situation we're in. That government got us in this mess on our dime in the first place is bad enough but they're continuing very poorly to try and manipulate the discourse for electoral and personal gain at this late stage as serious and compounding crises loom when people are so anxious to know what the near future will hold and how best they can prepare for it. This is what's becoming more than we should be willing to bear. We can take some degree of solace and vindication from the commission of inquiry now underway, especially with standing granted to the Labrador, Labrador land protectors, Grand Riverkeeper and the Muskrat Falls Concerned Citizens Coalition among others a forum to scrutinize the many mistakes and deceptions that helped us land us, helped land us in our present state is certainly called for. But refusing to make public any of these deceptions on the pretense of commercial sensitivity raises the question that bears repeating. 
why bother in the first place if some of the most powerful actors who have potentially wrought some of the most powerful consequences are allowed to simply excuse themselves from blame? What version, the, what, ver, what version of justice allows big business to be the single element in this left unscathed? Once more, I have to say it, the priority is loud and clear. But even so, let us not miss the opportunity for the inquiry's findings to, to propel us into a strong transition from probing the past into the even more critical task of figuring out how to face the future. It's been an honor to speak after so many who have enabled and inspired my own work. Thank you very much for having me. And up next we have Des Sullivan. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Steve Crocker for inviting me. And Dr. Crocker, I'm, as a teacher, I'm sure you're aware how important it is to connect with your audience in the, in the first few minutes. <laughs> and uh, I've gotten so smart since I left university that I can, I can tell the audience what they're thinking. And you're thinking, Another dinosaur has come back. <laughs> I came to university in 1970, so I'll keep this very short. And in 1972, I went on student council. And in 73, 74, I became CSU president, or CSU called in those days, Council of Student Union. Yeah, you, you guys changed it and screwed it up. Uh, the later crowd, the younger one. Uh, and now I have a little uh, nostalgia, naturally, as I, as I age. And yes, I see Facebook and Twitter and the blogs as great communicating platforms. Well, I have to tell you that in 1972, 73, and 74, we could get out 500 people in a student population of 5,000 to walk on Confederation building over student aid. So the platform is larger, but we had our ways. I have been asked by Dr. Crocker to discuss the Uncle Nardi blog and the impact it might have had on public understanding of the Muskrat Falls project. I will be careful not to perform an appraisal best left to others. One might ask, why blog anyway? It's a lot of work. One reason was that no clairvoyance was required to see that this project would end badly, and those who saw it that way, I think, had an obligation to warn the public. The business case could not stand up to scrutiny those responsible needed to be held to account. Nalcor gave a false narrative about the unavailability of power from the upper Churchill in 2041 and seriously understated construction risk. They constructed a 50 year demand forecast for electricity, which could not survive even the construction phase. Well, before construction started, the province and the feds were talking about the need to import Irish and Mexican labor because of competition for local hires from Western Canada. So don't tell me we built Muskrat Falls because we needed the jobs. There was no enforceable water management agreement governing coordination of the water flows on the Churchill River, a requirement before even one shovel of dirt should have been dug, and practically no senior mega project expertise. Cronyism helped select senior management and the board of directors. No independent oversight of the project was followed. Yet, we are led to believe, even as the cost doubled, that the decision to sanction was prudently made. The idea that a small society of half a million people should risk a multi-billion dollar project for a couple of hundred megawatts of power and let it skirt normal political and institutional checks and balances 
could only have been divined in the parallel universe of Alice in Wonderland. The truth is that the politicians of the day levered the sanctioned decision on a condition known as uninformed public, though admittedly denial and partisanship also played a role. The, period, the public, regretfully, is very late in acknowledging what has transpired. Hence, many are still focused on power rates. The conundrum of our time is whether to choose a wood stove or a mini split. When the whole province should be considering the ramifications of a crushed treasury and how it will affect decent health and social services. It is ironic too that Ed Martin and Danny Williams are stuck in a paradigm of delusion, each still perpetuating the myth that Newfoundland will be swimming in revenues from the project. Yet in our parallel world, not Lewis Carroll's, daily conversation is about rate mitigation and insolvency and the weight of a $25 billion total provincial debt. Against this backdrop, the question of whether the Uncle Nardy blog has been influential seems fanciful. I had hoped that it might help bridge the gulf between Nalcor perpetuated propaganda on the one hand and fact-based analysis on the other. The reality, however, is that it took billions of dollars of waste and cost overruns and the threat of energy poverty and insolvency, not objective analysis to awaken people to the charade. The blog's purpose was to try and fill a void left by a media that freely chose not to occupy the muskrat space. I had a few credentials to offer, but I like to think that the most important one was common sense. The internet afforded immediate accessibility and a reach in potential for the sharing of opinion and analysis, though I quickly learned that readership and public confidence are things hard won. For that reason, I think that any success achieved was due largely to persistence and possibly a recognition that a high standard of research and writing would have to be enforced. The consistency of the posts, the lengthy explanations, charts, exhibits, the absence of political bias, the practice of announcing revelations obtained under, under a TIPA or from confidential sources, and the opportunity to apply Nalcor's own words against them, which were often contradictory and embellished, at some point earned a steadily increasing readership. And yes, there are days I wake up and I want to apologize to iPhone readers. But you have your dinosaur, you have to put up with them. Highly complex issues needed to be tackled, however. From water management to the North Spur, from the stupidity of the dome to the ex exhibition of incompetent quality control exhibited best by the popped cable from the giveaway of both free and cheap power to Nova Scotia, which had no relationship to the cost of production, none, to the false promise of revenue from power exports. These, all of these things needed to be written about. They needed to be explained. They needed to be broken down so that people could understand them, to see what was this that critics were talking about, that they were making so much noise about, that muskrat was could be such a bad thing when others, most, most people, felt that it was worth eating. Even the 50-year power purchase agreement was sold under the, under the claim of intergenerational equity, whose purpose was to obscure a hideous take-or-pay contract that hooked island ratepayers for the full cost of the project one that was based on escalating demand among a declining population and absent the admission that the capital costs have been lowballed. 
complex posts often resulted. Many lacked the journalist's clearer style, their talent for making the complex comprehensible. Blog readership increased dramatically over time, which I largely attribute to the high quality of analysis performed by guest contributors. Planet NL today plan performs ex an exceptional financial and public policy analysis. But in the early days of Muskrat, JM was a star engin engineer with enormously valuable insights. David Verdi, who is here with us this evening, a former clerk of the Executive Council and chair of the PUB was a prodigious and insightful analyst and is still a major contributor. Cabot Martin's work on the North Spur was important, as was that of renowned hydro engineer James L. Gordon, who wrote many good posts. Like Planet NL and JM, there were contributors needing an anonymity, like Agent 13, and, and of course, the anonymous engineer. Undoubtedly, the clincher was the story of the anonymous engineer and the revelation supported by Grant Thornton that the budget estimates for the project had been lowballed. Was the Uncle Gnarly blog influential? Certainly the analysis contributed, I think, to a deepening public concern that in the euphoria of an impossible promise, they had been misled. Did it expose Ed Martin and help set the basis for his departure and the mishandling by the Ball administration of his severance package? It might have had an impact. Did it help expose Nalcor as a poorly led and un undeserving of the public trust? It did. Did the revelations of the anonymous engineer advance the call of the commission of inquiry? I, I, I honestly do believe it did. I think that without the revelations uh, made on the blog, a lot less light would have shined on the debacle. Denial by the, the authorities is much harder when the public record is, co is confirmed by proof that they were warned. For some, some politicians have suggested that bloggers should be ignored because they are not accountable. I would ask, are they less accountable than politicians? Especially, well, bloggers certainly don't have <laughs> politicians' protections like they do in the House of Assembly, do they? And like all citizens, bloggers must avoid slander. By and large, this group of scribes seek only to increase public dialogue. If they have other motives, I am surely not aware of them. They know that in the social media space, they will be called out in a millisecond if their narrative flies in the face of the facts. There is another dimension to this question too. How do we hold Danny and his colleagues to account? other than by rejecting them at the polls. Is that really sufficient accountability for inflicting monstrous damage on a small and vulnerable society? I think we have to think about that. Should we be quiet in the meantime? As a manipulative crown corporation selectively dishes out grants to a plethora of community, public service and other groups, in a scheme that duplicates the government's role, in which all, including those denied, are expected to remain silent for fear of disenfranchising themselves from future rewards. And, and it's not just the community groups. <laughs> Talk to virtually any contractor in this town, in this province. Talk to virtually any business person. Do you think they are prepared to go and criticize Nalcor or criticize the government? The reality is that the proof is there in their silence. The politics of fear and deference to arbitrary authority has no place in this province, and Uncle Gnarly has no time for that game. 
finally, I think that, by the way, there are two finalies in this, in this narrative. So I, I, I do, I do warn, warn you. There is at least some reason for hope when our institutions fail. An important example is the Access to Information Act, without which the ability of private citizens to play a role in the public policy apparatus and to expose bad decisions, cover-ups, and misinformation would be far more difficult. And I proved that just a couple of weeks ago, having put in uh, an ATIPA request, which was denied, no responsive records. I knew the difference. That helped. A, an appeal to the information commissioner brought back two volumes. Too large, they were too large to look at before I left uh, for Goose Bay the other day. So there, there is a message here for the blogging community, nevertheless, and it is that in addressing public policy issues, individual citizens have been granted a powerful platform, but the work is not effortless. It is a monumental task. Done poorly, you will be ignored. Done well, expect the readership build to be slow. As much as I have been critical of mainstream media, a free, responsive, and responsible press is a core requirement for a democratic society. I am guilty, mea culpa, I, of expressing frustration when they are unwilling to give an issue like muskrat investigative time, and the truth is they could have done far better. But muskrat, to be fair, required a depth of analysis unlikely to have come out of any media organization. The best breaks on muskrat ought to have been applied at the start, first by politicians sensitive to the risks being imposed on a small aging and shrinking population, and then by review institutions established for the purpose. Finally, <laughs> there are many expectations of Judge LeBlanc. I am hoping that he will chastise reckless politicians and feckless officials. But even more, I want to see him issue a clarion call for the strengthening of our oversight institutions. I hope he will throw down the gauntlet to the media, to other institutions, including Memorial University, and to all individuals and groups in our society, reminding us that we have to do better. I began by suggesting that Muskrat has the characteristics of parody in a world of Alice in Wonderland. Our problem, however, is that as a society, we don't get to put our version of that book down. In Alice, we find great humor. But the problem in its full dimension is that the solutions are no laughing matter. As much as they think it might, no individual, no group, and no institution, including Memorial, will escape Muskrat's, Muskrat Folly's cruel reward. Memorial can do more, however. Dr. Crocker is bringing the cultural community to the table for the first time. In addition, because the terms of reference set by government downplays the environmental, social, and political impact of Muskrat Falls, MUN researchers can fill that void and offer their research to the inquiry. They can also speak up, and very few have. In this context, Memorial will be expected to help find the solutions which, which will surely be needed if we are to remain a viable society in this province. Let me close by thanking Dr. Crocker for his leadership in sponsoring this symposium. Thank you. Hey, next up we've got Robin Whitaker. Uncle Gnarly is a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, so I want to start, first of all, by thanking Steve Crocker and Lisa Moore and Carrie Neal for 
doing such a wonderful job of organizing this. Is it, can you hear this okay? Yeah, okay. Um, and also all the other speakers, I really learned a lot from everybody. Um, it was a real privilege to get to sit through the, the whole day and hear everyone. Um, and a public service announcement from Angus Anderson. He has more of these uh, muskrat falls water stickers now with 10% methyl mercury. <laughs> so he's over there <laughs> if you want any. Um, okay, um, so I, I'm gonna come at this panel on journalism, democracy, and the control of inf information through what might seem like quite a narrow focus. What are the implications for democracy in this province of the charges laid against Justin Brake for reporting the October 2016 occupation of the Muskrat Falls worksite? More specifically, what are the implications of Nalcor's attempt through the courts and the RCMP to characterize his journalistic work as a crime against property? Um, and I will say that, you know, some of this resonates with um, the, some of the earlier talks today. And in, initially I was kind of worried about that. I thought I'm just going to be repeating what other people said. But then I started to think this really points to the salience of this issue in the logic of the questions that we're addressing. So along the way, I'll draw on Timothy Mitchell's distinction between two senses of democracy. We often equate democratic struggle with claims for justice and equality, but as Mitchell notes, democracy also refers to a method of governing by popular consent or some reference to popular consent, such that those claims for greater justice are kept in check by dividing the world into ostensibly separate spheres of governance. Only some of these are subject to public con contestation. So think, for example, of the only common sense, not in Uncle Gnarly's sense, <laughs> but the only common sense uh, division between the private sphere governed by rules of property, the natural world governed by rules of nature, and mar markets governed by principles of economics. In the second sense, democratic struggles become struggles over the boundaries between these spheres of governance struggles to move issues that have been set aside as private or legal and therefore non-political into the sphere of public contestation, for example. Now, everyone in this room is probably familiar with the broad details of the civil and criminal charges that have been laid against Justin when he was working for the Independent, but as a summary reminder, I'll just sketch the, the history of that, those events. So on October 22nd, 2016, about 40 Innu, Inuit, and settler Labradorians cut the lock on the main worksite at Muskrat Falls and walked to the workers' living quarters, which they occupied peacefully for four days. This occupation followed weeks of campaigns in Labrador and on the island to make Muskrat right in light of the provincial government's refusal to address scientific research suggesting that Muskrat Falls would lead to significant methyl mercury contamination of water and wild food if mitigation measures weren't taken. By this point, Billy Gautier had been on hunger strike for over a week and had been joined by several others er, a few days earlier. Justin Brake was the only journalist to follow the land protectors through the gate and the only one to report from inside the occupied work camp. His stories and live stream coverage were followed by tens of thousands of people provincially, nationally, and internationally. The independence reporting provided vital information at one of the most critical junctures in this province's re recent history. It also corrected misinformation and speculation about the nature of the occupation. Rumors that the occupation had turned violent, for instance, were easily dismissed because there was a journalist on site to demonstrate that the occupation was continuing as peacefully as it had started. And I think those kinds of things are, are vital given how such rumors serve as justification for heavy-handed policing. On October 24th, Nalcor secured a new court order compelling the police to arrest Justin if he didn't leave the work site. Once he learned about this in injunction, Justin left the site. It was not a decision he took lightly, as anyone who saw and heard the land protectors express their fears about what might happen to them without a reporter present will know. Those fears alone speak volumes to the importance of a free press in a democracy, particularly for people without the resources available to powerful corporations and governments. The land protectors ended their occupation on October 26th after Premier Dwight Ball finally held an extended emergency meeting with Indigenous leaders, a meeting held notably and shamefully in St. John's rather than Labrador. And I remember standing outside a uh, confederation building with Denise waiting for the, the answer to come down and it was, you know, midnight or later, wasn't it, by the time 
there was actually some sort of result from that meeting. Subsequently, the RCMP laid criminal charges of mischief and disobeying a court injunction against Justin and more than two dozen people who were involved in the occupation. Justin's lawyer, Jeff Budden, argued that the injunction should be overturned because Nalcor had failed to inform the court of the material fact that Justin was a working journalist when it applied for the injunction against him. Judge Murphy, Judge George Murphy rejected this argument at the outset. Justin, through Jeff, is appealing that decision. On the charge of mischief exceeding $5,000, the RCMP has resisted attempts to or requests to reveal what evidence led them to lay the charges, despite the fact that Justin was not an instigator of or a participant in the occupation. As he has said, Nalcor and the RCMP have both acknowledged that I didn't engage in any kind of destructive behavior. All I am guilty of is being physically present where the story was. In short, these charges entail an attempt to redefine Justin's work as a news gathering journalist as a crime against property. This brings me back to the crux of my argument about the nature of the democratic struggle at hand. As I noted above, Timothy Mitchell argues that democracy carries two kinds of meaning. To quote from his book, Carbon Democracy, Political Power in the Age of Oil, democracy can refer to ways of making effective claims for a more just and egalitarian common world or it can refer to a mode of governing populations that employs popular consent as a means of limiting such claims by dividing up the common world. Only certain areas get acknowledged as matters of public concern. Other fields are to be administered under alternative methods of control. For example, governmental practice can demarcate a private sphere governed by rules of property, a natural world governed by rules of nature, or markets governed by principles of economics. In consequence, democratic struggles become a battle over the distribution of issues. They become a struggle to establish that issues that others claim as private, as belonging to nature, or as ruled by the laws of the market are actually matters of public concern. In the rest of this talk, I want to argue that the criminalization of Justin Brake's journalism is diagnostic of two sets of democratic struggle ongoing in this province and this country. First, we have a struggle on Mitchell's second order a struggle to insist that the matters at hand remain open political questions, a struggle against attempts to privatize them, rendering them matters of property to be adjudicated legally, that is, non-political with the terms of debate settled by what the courts rule as admissible. Paradoxically, in this case, that means challenging Nalcor's assertion that it is in the public interest or that the public interest is best served by treating its claims to private property as sacrosanct. By extension, conflicts over what Justin Brake was up to when he followed protesters or pro protectors, I should say, onto the work site in, in October 2016 are struggles over which idea of democracy takes precedence, the one more focused on building a just and egalitarian shared world or the version in which popular consent or at least a regime legitimated by it is used to limit such claims by dividing that common world into different spheres, public and private, legal, economic, and political, for example. Central to both struggles is the way the civil and criminal cases against Justin Brake amount to a conflict between two sets of rights, rights relating to property and the right to press freedom. Now, the right to press freedom is constitutionally enshrined in Canada. Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees as one of our fundamental freedoms, the freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression including freedom of the press and other media of communication. As set out in the Charter's opening section, this right can only be constrained by such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Can the civil and criminal charges against Justin Brake pass this test? Only if you accept that private property rights trump the right to a free press. The clear provocation entailed in any such claim may be one reason for Nalcor's attempt to exclude Justin's status as a journalist from the adjudication of his case. As we heard this morning, the situation is further complicated by the fact that Nalcor's claim to the property in question is itself contested by, in a whole variety of ways by Indigenous Labradorians, who, as P Pam Palmater has pointed out, we're also asserting their charter rights to protect their lands and territories, as well as their right to hold to laws that predate those of the Canadian state. On the last point, it's critical to recall that contrary to common sense ideas, 
property is not a self-evident thing in the world. It is brought into being by relationships between social beings. As such, it is social and political through and through. By extension, there are different ways of understanding claims to property. Nalcor's position is based on the claim that it had the right to exclude others from its property. But as C.B. McPherson noted 40 years ago, property rights can also be understood as the right not to be excluded from the benefits of some shared property. The right, say, to clean water and safe food, or to draw from Patrick Wolfe and Audra Simpson, among many others, the right to exist as a people. To end with a few suggestions uh, pertinent to the panel theme, journalism, democracy, and the control of information, if we're serious about defending democracy in Mitchell's first sense, that is, democracy is defined by the struggle for a more just and equal shared world, then we need to, a challenge, then we need to challenge any attempt to neutralize that struggle by presenting the law, the market, and politics as self-evidently separate spheres of government or administration. In turn, this means talking about what rights constitute enabling conditions for any struggle for social justice. On this front, we must insist that the charter right to a free press extends to the critical journalistic role of news gathering, not simply to freedom of expression in some free-floating Jordan Peterson-esque sense. I would add that this defense of news gathering journalists is particularly important for those groups without ready access to the resources that would let them make their case or avoid scrutiny, as the case may be. We must also be ready to challenge willfully naive ideas of journalistic objectivity, particularly when journalists are reporting on protest movements that challenge the status quo. Somewhat paradoxically, the anti-politics of this case hinge on claims that Justin was not doing journalism, but by his very presence was part of a protest movement. I suspect that this claim would not have been made had even one journalist from the conventional press joined him when he walked through the gates. And here I will simply note that um, while Justin has won several press freedom awards and has been defended by national and international organizations, including Rapporteurs Sans Frontières and many journalistic journalists' unions, um, freedom of expression organizations, so he is, he is, his case has been championed by all those organizations. Some local journalists and editors withheld support. I will simply suggest that the failure to report dissenting perspectives does not constitute neutrality or objectivity. <laughs> More broadly, we need to reinvigorate debates about the role of property in democratic life and also to denaturalize the widespread but historically specific idea that property is inherently private and exclusive. This is particularly salient given the centrality of property to the logic of settler colonialism, and as Kim Talbert has said, the extent to which settler courts have privileged these ideas. On that front, then, I believe it's telling that early in this process, the Aboriginal People's Television Network, APTN, which Justin is now working for, sought intervener status in the civil case against him. APTN's interest speaks to the special threat that this case poses to journalists' ability to cover Indigenous-led protests involving disputes over large extraction projects, hydroelectric dams, pipelines, and so forth. If journalists are in danger of being arrested and jailed whenever they cover protests that take place on what one party claims as their private property, the implications for Indigenous people's ability to have their voices heard and to claim their rights will be very seriously impaired. So I'm going to end with a segue um, to Justin. In a conversation a year or more ago about these ongoing, and I should have probably noted that <laughs> we work together on The Independent, so my perspective is informed by that. Um, but Justin reflected that in the bigger fight for social justice, there are some moments that are especially critical, but that can be difficult to recognize at the time. These are moments when it is particularly important not to allow public silence or public pressure to win out. His case represents one of those moments for democratic life in the most fundamental sense, and dare I say it, for ongoing struggles to interrupt the logic of settler colonialism in this country. Thanks. Okay, and next up we have Justin Brake. 
I should have I should have given my leg a minute to wake up before I tried standing up here. <laughs> Thankfully, I've got a podium to lean on. Um, I, I just want to echo the uh, the thanks to the organizers, uh, Steve Crocker, Lisa Moore, Carrie, Neil, and uh, uh, for inviting me to be here. And um, and uh, it's an honor to be on the, this panel with these uh, speakers. Uh, the three very hard acts to follow. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be as eloquent. Um, I'm also going to be reading because there's a lot, there's uh, often times when I don't prepare written words, I, I miss uh, things that I that I later regret I hadn't said. So, um, <clears throat> and I do want to just acknowledge too Steve uh, Crocker's role in uh, my my education uh, as a journalist. Um, even though he doesn't teach journalism, uh, 11 years ago I came. Uh, to St. John's and started an undergrad degree at Munn to become a better journalist. And one of the first courses I took was a media sociology course with Steve. And I think that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and now I'm a criminal. <laughs> uh, so uh, I just uh, want to say too, that I just actually came back from, uh, Northern Manitoba, where um, I spent um, a week traveling around Northern Cree communities where hydro development has, uh, has impacted them for uh, four to five decades now. And uh, though, it, though, the, though this wasn't uh, part of, it, didn't, it wasn't in the reporting, um, s several people I had spoke with knew that I had covered Muskrat Falls and uh, they, they wanted to send a warning to the people of Labrador that um, uh, despite what they're being told by governments and corporations, things will get really bad if uh, if the if the Grand River, Mistashipu, the Churchill River, is dammed over and over and over and over again, like the Nelson and Churchill Rivers in northern Manitoba and the Burntwood River have been. The water is green, the fish are dying, there are very few people practicing traditional land-based economies anymore. The big takeaway from it is that, in addition to residential school and other uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, colonization and assimilation, hydroelectric development was right up there in terms of its destruction of culture and way of life uh, for the Cree. <coughs> I'm getting over a bad cough, so I apologize if I have to break to cough. If, I, if it turns really bad, uh, don't be awkward about it. I'm, uh, I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't need the Heimlich or anything like that. Um, so I, I uh, and I'm sharing photos here, many of them which have never been published or shared publicly before. These are from the archive of photos, hundreds of maybe a couple thousand photos that I took in the five or six weeks that I was in Labrador in uh, the fall of 2016 uh, as the, uh, the, the resistance movement um, uh, um, intensified in the lead up to uh, the potential flooding of the first, the first stage of flooding of the Muskrat Falls Reservoir. Um, so in kind of thinking about what to say about this, I mean, there's a lot to say. And of course, uh, in a matter of uh, months, uh, it's very possible I could be on a stand in, in a court, whether it's the Supreme Court or the Provincial Criminal Court here, making arguments. So I'm not going to make all of those arguments uh, today, but I am going to say a few things that I think are obvious to uh, those who kind of follow, uh, uh, you know, think about and read about and talk about uh, the... Uh, the relationship between journalism and democracy. And, uh, you know, when you, if you go to journalism school today, one of the sort of uh, books that's regarded as a Bible of an introduction to journalism, the purpose of it, the nature of journalism, the changing uh, elements of it is, uh, is a book called The Elements of Journalism written by Tom Rosenstiel and Bill Kovac. And they highlight a century old dichotomy in the, that book that still underpins much of the discussion around the relationship between journalism and democracy today. Uh, in the 1920s, American journalist Walter Lippmann suggested that the relationship between democracy and journalism was fundamentally flawed because, he said, uh, people mostly know the world indirectly through pictures they make up in their heads, those images conveyed through media. But as the gatekeepers of information, journalists adhere to subjective notions of newsworthiness and other journalistic principles. They decide what stories to tell the public, who to interview, what questions to ask, and so forth. Lippmann recognized this didn't result in quote unquote truth being transmitted to the public. And even if the public did receive truth through journalism, uh, their own biases, inattentiveness and ignorance undermines their ability to comprehend the truth, Kovac and Rosenstiel wrote about Lippmann. Uh, so countering Lippmann, philosopher John Dewey said, again in the words of Rosenstiel and Kovac, 
that the goal of democracy was not to manage public affairs efficiently, but rather to help people develop to their fullest potential. Democracy was the end, not the means. Dewey believed that if people were allowed to communicate freely with one another, democracy was the natural outgrowth of the human interaction. Democracy was not a stratagem for making government better. So we had a pessimistic and a fairly optimistic view of the role of journalism uh, in democracy and the, and the relationship between the two. Um, <clears throat> so those familiar with the independence coverage in 2016 of the indigenous-led resistance to Muskrat Falls will know that we relied heavily on social media to transmit information out of Labrador to readers and viewers across Canada and internationally. Um, some argue, excuse me, <coughs> look at the pictures while I'm coughing. Some argue that members of the publics, including citizen journalists, access to these same publishing platforms poses a threat to the media and to journalism. Rosenstiel and Kovac disagree. Uh, they, they this is a quote, um, they believe that the end of the press's monopoly over medi mediating information to the public offers the opportunity to elevate the quality of journalism we receive, not weaken it. For that to happen, however, those who produce journalism must acquire a better understanding of what citizens need from their news, what citizens and the machinery of the digital network can contribute to that, and a more rigorous grasp of the tasks necessary for trained journalists to organize, verify, and add to these contributions. One of those tasks they write is that, is that, uh, that of bearing witness to events, which they say occurs when the person functioning as a journalist is the sole observer of an event. At many crucial moments in the mounting resistance to phase one of flooding at Muskrat Falls, the Independent was the only media outlet present and served this fundamental role of bearing witness to important and newsworthy events. When, when grassroots people, Inu, Inu, Inuit and settler Labradorians, walked on the site together to the river to pray, to do ceremony, and in some cases to say goodbye to the Muskrat Falls, uh, the, the Independent was there when no media, when no other media were. When Todd Russell and members of the Nunatuavut Community Council defied the October 16th Supreme Court injunction, traveled upriver by boat, and asserted what they claimed are their Aboriginal rights to their ancestral lands, the Independent was the only media outlet there. When Nunatsiavut President Johannes Lamp, Inu Elder Elizabeth Panashwe, and Billy Gauthier on day four or five of his hunger strike joined about 150 to 200 grassroots people and marched up the Trans Labrador Highway and then onto the Muskrat Falls site, the Independent was the only media outlet there. When RCMP violently arrested Emily Wolfrey of Rigolette, who was distressed by the arrest of her father moments before, their family having traveled by boat to Muskrat Falls in, in a desperate attempt to protect <clears throat> their food, their community, and their way of life, the Independent was the only media outlet there. And when land protectors broke through the gate on the highway and occupied the Muskrat Falls workers' accommodations complex for four days, forcing provincial and indigenous leaders into an emergency meeting to consider the grassroots people's concerns and make specific public policy commitments, the Independent was the only media outlet there. Uh, in the course of this uh, reporting, as you know, I've been criminalized. The journalism I did has been deemed illegal, criminal, and punishable. For two years, as land protectors have been criminalized for their actions, uh, for, they, for two years they've been uh, criminalized for their actions and continue to fight to protect their food communities and way of life. And at the same time as that battle, they're fighting that battle, I'm fighting uh, a battle uh, to defend my decisions and actions as a journalist and ultimately um, uh, I've been put into a position where I uh, have no choice but to advocate for press freedom in Canada, which I'm happy to do, um, where I, uh, I'm seeing firsthand how the, <coughs> excuse me, how the threat, um, that, that threat uh, is, uh, that how press freedom is being uh, challenged and eroded is under threat. Um, freedom of expe expression, including freedom of the press, as uh, Robin noted, is one of the four fundamental freedoms guaranteed in Canada's constitution. It's been identified as one of the most important things required to ensure the integrity of our democratic society. And as Robin and others have noted, uh, the case appears to pit uh, private property rights uh, versus constitutionally protected uh, freedom of the press. Some <clears throat> have argued that journalists are not above the law. No one I'm aware of says that journalists are above the law. But as Osgood constitutional law professor Jamie Cameron has written, there must be a clear distinction between journalists and others when it comes to news gathering processes. 
that is in following a story of public interest, even it should even if it should move on to public property. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Jamie Cameron uh, writes, some preferential or distinctive treatment is necessary to enable the press to discharge its democratic responsibilities. The press function is directly linked to democratic governance because it provides the means for the public to hold government and other sources and other sources of power, whether corporate, institutional, or individual, up to scrutiny. She continues, the kind of transparency that promotes accountability can only be achieved through robust reporting and commentary by a press that operates free from government interference and functions independent of the state. This function is distinctive and institutional in nature and cannot be served unless news gathering is free from interfer interference by the state. My news gathering at a moment when the information flowing out of the occupied camp was crucial to a fuller understanding of the situation and at a time when power was being challenged in a significant and argu arguably unprecedented way by mostly indigenous grassroots people was disrupted with the threat of arrest and a criminal record by a crown corporation and by the state, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. When John Ralston Saul gave me Penn Canada's 2018 uh, Ken Philkow Award in June, he commented that the fact this case involves an isolated site and indigenous people, Muskrat Falls and the Innu and Inuit, takes us back to the worst of old Canada in which the states and corporations effectively collaborated with each other in order to sideline indigenous rights and wishes. Justin Brake's coverage ensured that this old style attempt at maintaining silence around questionable actions was not successful. The corporation and the state are attempting to punish him for doing his job properly. As some of you know, I now work for APTN, <clears throat> who's been uh, very uh, tremendously supportive of me and my, uh, my court battle, and they've intervened on the civil charge. Um, in their affidavit to uh, the court, um, the director of news and current affairs, Karen Pugliese, argues that a conviction against me would be devastating for APTN, which makes explicit effort to cover indigenous land defense actions from Elsie Buktuk to Muskrat Falls, Standing Rock to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. APTN's been there much of the time and believes it must be there in order to properly and adequately, adequately inform its viewers. Uh, Pugliese sa said in the affidavit that if journalists are prevented from accessing sites, gathering footage, interviewing land and water protectors, and publishing the facts as they unfold, when Aboriginal people express resistance to private and public development projects, reporters will be limited in their ability to provide these perspectives and to serve the public interest. Preventing or deterring journalists from doing this work will perpetuate the underrepresentation or misrepresentation of Aboriginal people and Aboriginal-led protests in Canadian media. And I'm going to speak to that issue just for a, a moment as well, the representation of Indigenous people in Canadian newspapers. Um, Mark Cronland uh, Anderson and Carmen Robertson author, co-authored a book called Seeing Red, and it looks at the history of representation of Indigenous people in Canadian newspapers from 1869 to present, which was about 2011 when the book was published. So basically 150 years, almost the entire uh, time Canada has been a, a, a country. <coughs> Excuse me. In an exhaustive survey of Canadian newspapers, uh, they conclude what most Indigenous people already know from lived experience. Quote, in general, it avers that Indigenous peoples, uh, when compared to white Canadians, exemplify three essentialized sets of characteristics, depravity, innate inferiority, and a stubborn resistance to progress. The outcome of this consistent coverage, the authors argue, is that mainstream press has facilitated the ongoing colonization of Indigenous lands and peoples by presenting Native people as a troubled, backward, unreasonable other and therefore telling the public nothing accurate or substantial about Indigenous peoples, while also helping to normalize the narrative of Canada as a noble country founded not on genocide or land theft, but rather on a much kinder imperialist, imperialist and colonialist agenda. Through Canadian newspapers, Indigenous peoples, quote, fit in the Canadian colonial project as others des designated outsiders in their own homeland, Anderson and Robertson write, they continue, the rub is that the constructed other, as noted, bears little resemblance to reality, as is clearly the case with stereotyped Indigenous peoples. Yet the other has a key role to play for Canada and for the for has a key role to play in the in Canada in the Canadian imaginary uh, that Aboriginal Aboriginals serve uh, to remind the mainstream media about the value of its own self -per perceptions while using Indigenous peoples. Uh, behavior per portrayed through colonial lenses as a means to gauge itself in positive ways. 
And this is how I would argue to an extent uh, how newspapers in Newfoundland and Labrador and Canada have represented Indigenous peoples fighting to protect their land, communities and way of life from the harms of hydro development on Mista Shipu or the Churchill River, rather than call them land protectors as members of the movement called themselves, and which was a more accurate reflection of their actions and motives, the press continued to depict, depict Indigenous peoples literally protecting their lands as protesters, a term which carries many connotations, among them the idea of oppositional or reactive by nature and as angry or unreasonable. And perhaps even as carrying those essentialized characteristics identified by Anderson and Robertson as depraved, innately inferior, and as stubbornly resistant to progress. But it was the live coverage from inside the occupied Muskrat Falls camp where I think the independence reporting had perhaps the greatest impact. All of the media's coverage in the days, weeks and months and years leading up to the occupation set the stage, it could be argued, for the media and its colonial ways to put the nail in the coffin for those indigenous peoples who had been so misrepresented or underrepresented to the point where once the political, legal and other institutions failed to protect them from imminent harm, they felt they had no choice but to break Canadian laws in order to save themselves. Despite knowing the majority of media and the and, the, and that what and that is uh, they you know that those that that situation that unfolded and the decisions that they made were despite knowing that the majority of of uh, Canadian media and the public were not necessarily supportive of their cause. On October 22nd, 2016, moments after the lock was cut on the gate, now Core Energy tweeted that there was a significant safety risk to protesters and workers as, pro as protesters have entered the Muskrat Falls work site, and that they are urging everyone at the Muskrat Falls site to exercise extreme caution. Please be safe. We are extremely concerned for your safety, they said. The Independence live coverage of the occupation began minutes later, showing 50 to 60 land protectors, most of them Innu and Inuit, peacefully entering the workers' complex and shaking hands with and hugging workers, engaging in a hulik ceremony, singing the ode, to uh, the ode to Labrador with smiles on their faces, reacting to messages from the government in Nalcor, deliberating in their decisions and strategizing over the prospect of a violent police retaliation, which in the past has resulted in injury and even death, especially when the press is not present, as noted by the uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and countless other uh, um, bodies and scholars uh, to bear witness to the situation and so forth. <clears throat> Most workers we tried to interview feared reprisal from NALCOR if they shared their own thoughts on the record, but a few did share their thoughts with us, another crucial component of the independence coverage of the occupation. The message of potential violence and danger perpetuated by an at times uncritical press outside the occupied site who could not confirm the claims by way of eyewitness account was countered by journalism produced by the independent. Our coverage dispelled and or debunked the perception that workers' safety was compromised, placating concerns expressed by NALCOR, the government, journalists, and the families of those inside the camp. And all, <clears throat> and all of this at a critical moment in the history uh, of the Innu, Inuit and settler, and settler Labradorians and in the history of Newfoundland and Labrador as a province. This was not criminal, it was indisputably uh, journalism in the public interest, and it was crucial information that whether you believe democracy exists in such things as the practice of good journalism, or whether it's the outcome of an informed public being moved closer to truth, irrefutably shaped public opinion and arguably influenced public policy. It was also the product of journalists exercising their constitutionally protected right to report on a matter of public interest and to serve the public's right to know. To uphold the freedom of the press, is inherently and necessarily to strengthen democracy. In the words of Jamie Cameron, to protect freedom is to pose a test of courage, the courage of democracy, its communities and individuals. Thank you. Okay, wow, that was incredible. Uh, so we're just gonna do a short 15-minute uh, Q&A, and then uh, Denise and some others have kindly offered to uh, end our, uh, present, our event today with a water ceremony. So we're really excited about that. Um, so if anyone, oh, and we're gonna ask Kyla and Roberto to come join us down here if anyone has questions for them as well.
Got it. Uh, I want to ask a question to the last panel, uh, and I'll preface my question by uh, telling you that I've just spent the last two weeks uh, partly in Labrador and partly here glued to the, uh, tele to the computer watching the Muskrat Falls Commission of Inquiry. And uh, I've spent a fair bit of time dealing with uh, commenting on the terms of reference and uh, dealing with uh, our, as a member of the coalition, dealing with the uh, questions for our legal counsel. But my question to you is, for each member of the last panel, and that, and that question is, is, do you believe that journalistic, journalistic freedom uh, is included uh, uh, in the terms of reference for the Royal Commission, for the Commission of Inquiry, and if not, should it be? That's my question. David, I think the short answer is no. I, I do not uh, recall um, a view within the interpretation of the terms of reference uh, that accommodates that very question. That said, I have come to some conclusion over uh, the last few weeks about the terms of reference and that while we discuss it in a context of whether it is actually broad enough, uh, I am more careful that perhaps it is broad enough and that an issue such as journalistic freedom and journalistic responsibility may be well outside uh, the terms of reference. You may be disappointed with that response, but I think it's such an important issue, including with, which, which has been exposed very raw, in a very raw way by the, uh, the Muskrat debate and the Muskrat issue, that it probably is deserving of a wider panel as a single issue because We cannot forget that in this province, a good many limitations are placed on our society by virtue of our size. And uh, whether we talk about aspects of business or economics or industrial development, we're constantly preoccupied with the question of scale. And we expect a lot, and we should, from the journalistic community with regard uh, to what they do and what they're responsible for. And I, for one, certainly don't believe that they have stepped up. But I think that it is a conversation, perhaps not appropriately uh, the responsibility of this, term, of this inquiry I think it's got more than enough on its hands, but that's a. I'm not sure if this is on, yeah. Uh, so I'm Ashley Fitzpatrick. I'm a reporter with The Telegram. I'm part of the mainstream media, boo and hiss as you will. I want to say I've been covering Muskrat Falls since I think about 2011. Um, from the get-go, I'm pretty emotional, so just bear with me. Uh, from the get-go, just to start, I have no issue with any of the work that's been done by the people on this panel. I think that the more voices, the more research we have, the more encouragement for public dialogue, the better overall. Um, when we come down to criticisms of the people who have been working on this, just please keep in mind that there are a lot of us who have worked very hard to try and bring forward the facts around this project <sighs> sorry to the point where we make decisions for our own lives that are very difficult and we are criticized on a daily basis for it so please just remember that there are people who are not represented on this panel 
who are putting in their lives for a decade now to try and help the community as a whole. We have not been perfect. We have some reflection to do. There are some larger issues at play that are affecting the entire country, the entire world in terms of journalistic capacity and capability right now that are also also in play. P please don't for a second support what I have been called at points in time throughout this project of racism, ignorance, disinterest, there are a list of times when the independent was not represented at events and other journalists were there. In terms of methyl mercury, I myself was reporting back in 2012, 2011, the event, the atrocious event where the new Nazi of a government was forced to come to St. John's to hold a press conference to try and put this on the public radar, the political radar. We were there. We have been working on it, trying to support what is being put out there, and we're, we are working on it. So please just try and keep that in mind that there are real people involved here. And I myself have been covering the Muskrat Falls inquiry and had to make the choice as because this project is essentially operating in two places, in St. John's and in Central Labrador. You cannot be everywhere at once. We have done our best to try and cover what we can, the individual reporters. And during this inquiry, I myself was forced to make the choice of when I would come home to say goodbye to my grandmother who passed away this past weekend and I was not here because in part, I was afraid of what would be said if we weren't there on any given day. So that's all I have to say, and I'm sorry I got so emotional, but it has been years of hearing this, of hearing that nobody cares, that nobody paid attention, that it was not represented when at times it was, and there are bigger dialogues that are happening. And I'll say thank you to the presenters today. It was always good to hear new information. And I try to take that in at all points that I can. My weekends, my evenings, I've been given up to reading reports. Family events have been forsaken for the sake of press conferences. Please do not think that we don't care because we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angus Anderson. Thank you, panel, for an amazing presentation and different ways of dealing with this whole project, Muskrat Falls, our government, corporation, Crown Corporation, Muskrat Falls. And I was so glad to hear when um, APTN is going to help Justin. And because as a early budding reporter with the Ohala Hati Society in Nain, uh, we were, at the time, different regional broadcasting systems. We had Duhalahati in Labrador, and different group in Northern Quebec and Baffin Island and in Uvalde. We were all broadcasting at that time our story through CBC. So everything we put out there, even those information were censored by CBC before they can broadcast it. But since forming APTN, which we helped through Halahati, like instead of going through CBC now, we can do, APTN can do the story with, without being censored. So when they hired Justin, I was very happy to hear that. And the way I see mainstream media, CBC or VOCM and national, they're all being censored by the government. That's why a lot of journalists are afraid to tell the truth of what they see. Because what they want to report, they can't report fully, only in portions, unlike APTN. And thank you all for all what you do. OK. 
can I take an editorial, uh, I don't know what, advantage here, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to make a point that, uh, going back to some things that Des Sullivan said about blogging, I mean, I think that the power of his blog and of blogging and the kind of citizen activism and so on in this case has really been tied to the lack of investigative journalism, that we really are where we are now in understanding Muskrat Falls and issues that are before the inquiry and that kind of thing because of citizen activists who have pursued that for nothing other than an interest in the public good. So an important part of that, I mean, is the new explosion of the blogosphere and immediate access to information and all of that kind of thing. But it's important to keep in mind that that's happening in the context of a withdrawal of investigative journalism into those projects. That one of the consequences of that is that it doesn't divide up the information. You have no flexibility with it. So when you do get information now, it's an enormous block of it that nobody can take in. If that was parsed out over eight or 10 years, we become familiar with the internal distinctions and so on, we begin to know how to think about it. We know more about Stormy Daniels and Trump and all of the intricacies of their non-disclosure agreements and all of that sort of thing than we do about the financing of Muskrat Falls. That is the consequence of a lack of investigative journalism that it's not at our fingertips. We don't know the fine distinctions. Uh, it, now it is an enormous amount of energy to go after that mountain of information and to figure out the connections and so on one of the benefits of journalism is that it does the kinds of things that Ernst von Nerli has been doing because that position has been evacuated, I think, by investigative journalism. That's all I wanted to say. And to go back, to, thank you for your comments. That Those were really powerful. And it's important to keep in mind that it is the institutions of journalism, I think, that are really in question here, the, the editorial decisions about where journalistic resources are going to go, more so than the individual proclivities of particular journalists, how are large-scale journalist organizations deciding what they're going to do with their resources over long periods of time that it would take to dedicate investigative journalists to major stories that have major public impacts. So a thank you, I guess, to the Des Sullivans of the world who have tirelessly pursued that and, and the Dave Vardys and Ron Pennies and others who really have made us informed to the extent that we are. But also, let's not forget that uh, mainstream media has been cut to the bone, that we have seen the Telegram winnowed down, that we have seen the CBC decimated, that we are asking people to go out and get stories that they are, you know, do not have the finances required to do that with in many, many cases. So uh, thank you, Ashley, for, you know, bringing this to our attention, but also let's keep in mind that this is an institution, this is a governmental problem, an institutional problem, a problem across the country, and not perhaps the problem of individual writers who are trying to do their work. Thank you very much, and, and I want to thank you, Ashley. I know as a politician in, in 2011, boy, was I ever a greenhorn. Um, and I gobbled everything you wrote. I read every word that you wrote because we were under a time of incredible secrecy from this government, from NALCOR, which is a rogue nation. NALCOR is a rogue nation and it's meant to be an, a rogue nation. And then I gobbled everything you wrote, Des, and everything that every guest wrote. I gobbled it up and everything I could find on Facebook and, 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 and uh, Justin, I read everything, I watched everything, I listened to everything you did in The Independent because we had to, because our government wasn't telling us the truth and because NALCOR wasn't telling us the truth. And I can remember late one night in our caucus office when we knew that the vote was coming down for sanction. And Lorraine Michael said, my God, what can we do? What can we do to get people to pay attention? because people weren't paying attention, because they believed Danny. Danny would do us no wrong. Danny was presenting a savior's plan for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And we said, we have to filibuster if that's all that we have. Maybe if we filibuster and show people how important this is, to show people, to say to people, pay attention, look what's coming down. We all did that. People covered it, um, and here we are.
And here we are, and all under a continued cloak of, of secrecy. Steve Tomlin, I read everything you tweeted. You know, the people who were brave and courageous, including many in the mainstream media, because we depended so much on what you wrote in your analysis, your courageous analysis that I knew took hours and hours and hours of work to decipher even the volumes of, of information that were thrown out there. Um, and here we are. I think we should end it there. Um, thank you, everyone. I want to. Okay, getting overruled. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a question to the panel there generally, um, and it would be that you know you guys are doing a great job uh, giving us information. I mean, I, I read a variety of sources. It depends what's in front of me. It depends how much time I have. Depends on how much schoolwork I have. Um, but my question to you is, is do you think it, it would be more important, and, you know, f forgive me, uh, you know, all the panelists are, are doing a fabulous job, and, and certainly I've digested a, a good portion of it. But I guess my question is to Mr. Sullivan more specifically, is that do you think that you know, given your, your current status here in Newfoundland, that it might be, that you might do more good running for office than operating your blog. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me put that thought right out of your mind. <laughs> in, I'm still waiting for my my deposit from the 1975 election. And it's, I just know finally, it dawned on me a few years back that I was probably, it was probably never going to be returned. Uh, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but no. Every, you know, um, let, me, let me address uh, it this way. And I acknowledge uh, what Ashley has said, and Ashley knows that I have been one of the culprits criticizing the media, rarely the telegram, because the truth is that the telegram has been one of the most reliable and productive mediums uh, in this province, going right back to the early days and apart from Ashley, one of the people that I hold in very high esteem is Russell Wangerski. And his insightful analysis, he has never stepped away from this project. People, by and large, didn't acknowledge his insights. They do now, but he started this out even before I did. And uh, I think that we have to acknowledge that fact. But to your specific point, all citizen bloggers or those who feel that the community needs more information or needs a different kind of analysis than what is offered by main my mainstream media can't be viewed as just all potential politicians. There's an inherent risk in that because the whole, the whole process then becomes, ah, uh, he's just a blogger because he's, he's, he's working on the next election. And that's, that's perfectly understandable. People should have, people should have a reasonable de degree of skepticism in all of this. That's why when, when, on Facebook or wherever the suggestion uh, comes up, I like to put it to bed because it ain't going to happen. I'm, I, as one citizen, uh, see and, and have seen, along with Bertie and Penny and others, Jim uh, is, is up here who has written a hell of a lot and spoken 
uh, a heck of a lot with regard to this uh, project, and we've we've benefited uh, from uh, from his insights. There are others too, but we, I think, just simply have to be viewed on our merits, whatever they may be, and that in the final analysis, we just simply need people who have taken the time, prepared to give reasoned analysis, and will lay it out, and that we have only the motive that this is something that interests us, and we think that it should be shared, and that we think the community might benefit, it, benefit from it, but otherwise, that we are not establishing a platform for election. Does, does, that, a, does, does that answer your question? I suppose so. Do you know what you're asking for? <laughs> I'll leave that to you to ask him. <laughs> I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest that we all say loudly and together that Danny Williams is a strong personality. <laughs> uh, no, in all earnestness, uh, I would like to thank this panel for the, and the previous panel for the tremendous work that they've done today. And, for the, and I'd like to thank you all for being here, especially those who are here for the whole day um, and yesterday. Um, we're going to have Denise Cole lead us in a song but yeah, she's leading us in the song. So come on up, Denise. And then we will go to the reception and we can all talk together. Are we still live streaming? Yes. So those who are watching, you all know this song. You know it from October 2016. We started in St. John's. We took it back home to Labrador. And we still find any reason we can to sing it now. So this is the water song. It's a song that was actually gifted to me by the beautiful indigenous people of St. John's to come to me as we occupied the, uh, what's that building? They, all the gators and the bunch of settlers and the crack place. And that's where I learned this song and people had to watch us sing it for like almost eight hours on the <laughs> So now the whole province in the world really knows it. So we do it in a round and we, if you have enough of that, we can probably do it around this and do that before we do it in four directions. And uh, once you're here, it's, it's pretty catchy. Just join in. And that's how we're going to. We open in ceremony and prayers. Is Dorothy and, and Gerard still here? The artist from last night? He started the first session in prayer, so this is, we're going to close it in song, which is also prayer. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 